So, uh, Second Temple, what were some of the, like the false prophecies and the false beliefs around the Second Temple? Well, in the uh, Second Temple, in the rabbinic scholastic society, there was uh, certain expectations around the Messiah because the whole focus was the expectation of the Messiah. So, in the various teachings and the various rabbis, they would have unique theories as to the Messiah, because they knew it was a reality. And so in the Second Temple prophets, such as Jeremiah and Daniel, and you, know, you had all these Second Temple prophets, you know, when, when Babylon was gonna come and destroy you know, uh, uh, Solomon's temple, God gave assurance by raising up prophets to say, okay, well, I have a purpose to this, but I'm gonna restore. Like even Ezekiel, there was a picture of a restored temple, the last part of Ezekiel. And it was a prophetic temple and it all had prophetic symbolism behind it so most of the teachings believe it or not were eschatological most of the teachings were coming out of isaiah jeremiah ezekiel daniel and so they didn't see a separation in the ultimate picture of the culmination of the victory of israel you know over the world over all the nations over all the gentiles and so if you go back and you look at all the eschatological and time, how God sums up the entire gospel reality, we don't naturally see the break between the redemption picture, the salvation picture, the paying the price for our sins, and the ultimate conquest and victory, which of course easily uh, appealed to pride and the idea of the desire to rule and to have conquest. but glazing over or quickly moving over the suffering messiah uh the even daniel chapter 9 its main focus was the idea that sin had to be paid for so there had to be the the summing up of transgression and the the priest reality the priestly reality they were mostly focused on the kingly reality so the messiah was definitely to have a priest dimension and a king dimension but they were looking more and uh jumping straight to the king part of it of course when christ came he dealt with what he felt and knows is man's greatest need and that is the need of redemption and so it's very important to uh understand that they were teaching what was in second temple prophets teachings which was ultimate glory of reigning over the Gentiles, the ultimate picture of this great purpose of Abraham was to inherit the nations. And so they saw themselves as automatic heirs because they were, quote, of the seed and they got into a mentality of strict literalism. Am I of this tribe? So they really got into their genealogies and that it was going to happen through the flesh. And so even Paul himself was addressing the kind of deception that they're thinking the circumcision and coming from Benjamin or coming from whatever tribe that for sure they were going to receive the inheritance through the flesh. And ironically, the covenant on Sinai or the covenant of Abraham of circumcision was actually ironically turning into a covenant of the flesh when God obviously was speaking of a much greater concept. And that is Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah were all talking about the promise that God had made to rest the covenant upon himself by assuming and swallowing up our sin debt. And so when Christ came, it was a grand disappointment because the rabbis were really pushing this grand picture of ruling over the Gentiles. And legitimately so, it was in the Second Temple prophets, no doubt about it. But unfortunately, they were stumbling over the great stumbling block that God would have to build, quote, the, uh, the temple that was a much greater temple, a much greater than Solomon's temple. He's going to have to build the temple of redemption, the, the temple of establishing the heavenly temple built upon the fact that he would be the human seed that would rest upon him would be the redemption of humanity by assuming their debt and he would come in an incarnation. That was, to us now, it seems obvious that Isaiah chapter 7, from a virgin, is going to be born a child, that the government's going to rest upon his shoulders in chapter 9, that God is going to manifest himself 
in, as a manual in chapter 8 and that he will come and that he will let the entire burden of, uh, of, of sin and the government of God to rest upon himself in his priesthood in a kind of a Levitical sense in that way. But unfortunately, rabbinic teaching more focused on the glory of Israel in the sense that it uh, was going to ultimately rule the Gentiles as the great light of the world. So they missed the messianic reality and the fact that God was going to bear this covenant upon himself, literally. So when Christ came and he's talking about basically you are seeds, but I am the seed, that you are Israel in the flesh, but I am Israel in person and in reality. And the reality of that stood before Abraham, before Abraham was, I am. That's a huge covenant reality, along with the fact that it was the proclamation of his divinity. But he wasn't just trying to prove his divinity. This was covenant language that he was making before the people. And he is saying that I'm not just a teacher, just a rabbi. I am the teacher. I'm the messenger. I am the rabbi. But the reality is, he says, call no man father. That Call no man rabbi. He's basically, call no man great. Call no man your ruler. Because when he shows up, he is the king of the kings. And he is the lord of the lords. And he's the servant of the servants. And he's the rabbi of the rabbis. He's the messenger of the messengers. So when Christ comes, he assimilates and consumes and swallows up everything around him. So when he showed up, he was an affront to the scholastic rabbinic system that insisted on its own eschatological kind of a teaching because there's no doubt about it the second temple was an eschatological in other words a picture of what was daniel asking the angel gabriel when are these things going to be when are you going to make this happen uh, uh, how long lord and then the answer would be until 2300 evening mornings or it would be in response to the visions that God was giving Daniel and the picture that Daniel had is the restoration of that temple, that second temple, that the Messiah is going to come to that temple. But the what was minimized and glossed over was, just like even today, is our need for redemption in face of the fact that God is righteous and holy and that he is looking at our greatest need and that is the assumption of our debt totally in order for us to be atoned to him, to be made one with him. So they missed the sacrificial humility of God that he would enter into our burdens. And Christ was unfortunately an affront to that because he was rightly a king. And that's why, quick example, the discussions between Christ and the Pharisees were many times about ruler authority. What's your authority? And then the trial of Christ, what's the discussion that's happened between him and Pontius Pilate? Well, it was always around, are you a king? And even Pontius Pilate himself finally puts the placard over Christ's cross and says, the king of the Jews. That was uh, such the climate. That was so much of the focal point of that entire society because all Pontius Pilate wanted to know is, are you a threat to the Roman system? Christ made it abundantly clear that the kingdom that I'm going to bring is not of this world. The only authority that you have, and he's talking like a king, is the authority that God gives to you. And so this was the climate. It was a highly eschatological climate. In other words, it was a climate that was looking at ultimate consummation of a ruler of rulers. Now we, we see something that seems obvious to us, that, he w that the, the, the testimony of Scripture divides... Uh, it in, into basically two divisions. One is salvation, redemption, payment of debt. And then secondly, it is uh, rulership and kingly dominion and the such like that. But at the time, those things were not clearly divided. They seemed like that they were one and the same. So, for example, the expectation of the rabbis that were teaching was that the Messiah would come and he would rule as a general and he would speak his word to resurrect the entire dead. In Ezekiel 37, where he would, I think it's 36 and 37, where he would, in a covenant, 
renew all the armies of Israel, raise them from the dead, bring them back to life, and then rule the world through this mega army from all the period, all the way back to David and everything else that he would rule in a mighty way, including Abraham. So, so the concept of the resurrection with the Pharisees is that he would resurrect the great army. When Christ fed the 5,000 families, and uh, they wanted to make him king. Remember, that was a big thing. They wanted to make him king, and he had to disappear from them. Why they want to make him king? Because the way that nations would be defeated is that you would siege a nation. And so to show your power is that it was a war of attrition. You would surround a city and that you would starve them out. And then if you can outlast, like in Masada, if you could outlast your enemies, then they would have to go away because their provision would only last so much. Well, if you had a Messiah in which, even if you're under a siege, that he could keep producing bread and fish and water in that way, that this was evidence of a, basically a military picture of like a Hezekiah or a David or, you know, in this way that even under a siege, that they would still prosper. So they were very much looking toward a, a, a conquest and uh, the idea of casting off the Roman yoke uh, would be the sign to them that, uh, that the Messiah has come. So, you know, this is kind of a, very much of the climate. It was very much of an eschatological climate because the second temple was a picture of the fulfillment of Messiah coming. And all the prophets that were referencing the second temple we're all ultimately moving on to glorious pictures of ruling over the entire world.